Hey guys and welcome back to Alan Cook's Science Show. So before we start, I have a quick update. Do you remember a couple of videos ago I said on my bucket list I want to go to a carnivorous plant bog? Yes. So this weekend we actually went on an awesome camping and hiking trip and we went to a carnivorous plant bog. It was so awesome. In one area we saw four different types of carnivorous plants. We saw pitcher plants, two types of sundews, which are my favorite plant, and a Venus flytrap. And it was so awesome. Oh. Also, we were walking through a bog uh, at another location and I was carrying Miss Monkey here because she doesn't like to get her paws wet, of course. And I like fell in a hole and just kind of fell down and Miss Monkey just lied on top of me because queens don't get their toesies wet or something like that. Today I wanted to talk about a special subject that was requested by my friend who's a teacher. And so uh, today we're going to talk about genes and heredity. Do you know what that means, Colette? That is an amazing guess, um, but it's not correct. So we're going to start with genes first because not only did we kind of talk about them a little bit a couple videos ago, but they're the building block of everything. So you got to start somewhere, right? Every cell within every living thing has a genetic code specific to that organism. And our cells can read this genetic code, translate it into something that can create a protein which does all the functioning of our entire body and all of our cells. So that's that central dogma thing that I mentioned a couple videos ago. Yes, the dog thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we pass off our genes from parent to offspring. In fact, right now you have half of your maternal genes and half of your paternal genes. So half from your mom, half from your dad. And not only do we pass on the genes, but we pass on the traits that they code for. So you might have a bunch of genes that give you your mom's eyes or your dad's smile. So passing on these genes and in turn passing on these traits from generation to generation is called heredity. So heredity is why we might look like members of our family because we share a lot of the same genes and a lot of those same traits. So Colette here is half Australian Shepherd and half Sheltie. That means that she has her mom's floppy ears and kind of stockier build and her dad's long snooped, I'm sorry, and brown, brown coat. Yeah, you're right. And some of her siblings didn't have the same color coat or the same traits. They had a mix of what their mom or dad might have had. And we humans have used these traits for over thousands of years, whether it be crossbreeding different dogs to get desired traits or in getting different crops or animals for our agriculture. So we bred these plants and these animals to have the desired traits that would help us survive. Corn, for example, did not always look like the corn we have today. We had to crossbreed it to get it to what we needed. And these corns were not only passing on their traits, but were passing on their genes. We may have selectively bred things in the past, but today scientists can actually genetically engineer crops in a lab in a much quicker way that doesn't take thousands of years. They can insert new DNA into a crop. Uh, and sometimes it can be wacky, like I worked in a lab that did research on strawberries and while some of it was like more helpful nutri nutrient, um, some of the strawberries were genetically engineered just to smell like Fruit Loops. Sometimes though these genetically modified organisms or GMOs uh, are more helpful. Like uh, there was a lab that worked near me that was trying to find a way to grow corn that was resistant to this fungus, this corn blight that was destroying a lot of crop. Or they can be uh, genetically modified to add nutrients to food so that we can feed the world on a smaller amount of land. I'll have to make a video on GMOs in the future because there's so much to talk about, pros, cons, a whole lot of stuff. So uh, next time. <laughs> Now remember when I said we have all this DNA to make proteins? Well, apparently we only use about 1% of our DNA. And in the past scientists thought, oh, the rest is just junk DNA. But actually a lot of them have different functions. They just don't actively make proteins. One of my favorite things though is epigenetics. Epigenetics is basically uh, things in the environment turning on specific genes. It's so cool. So hydrangea is a great example of this. Uh, the flowers are usually pink, but if their soil becomes too acidic, the flowers will turn blue. Exactly. 
Nieha. I'm genetically predisposed to get more freckles in the sun, and uh, if you don't get enough nutrients and vitamins early in life, you might have stunted growth. I wonder, yeah, if only I had the means to feed you uh, sockeye salmon every single day. Another biological concept is instinct. Not, not stink, instinct. Um, these are things that animals are born already knowing. One big example is when you're a baby, whether you're a human baby or dog baby, crying for someone to come help you when you can't meet your own needs. It could also be an animal knowing how to stand and run away right minutes after birth. Or maybe a bird that weaves nests. That is not a learned behavior. That is something that they instinctively know how to do. Or migration. I also love watching spiders make, make their webs. That is such an awesome instinct and every spider knows how to make their specific web. So these instincts, just like our biological traits, have been passed down through genetics from generation to generation because it helped their ancestors survive in the past and it will continue to help them survive, essentially. Isn't that cool? That is a great question, Colette. So all dogs have a few instincts. They might have communication instincts, barking, yelping, wagging of the tail, pulling back the ears. These are all ways dogs can communicate how they're feeling or what they want to say. That's instinct. And you, being Australian Shepherd Sheltie, you should have some herding instinct somewhere in there. I've never taught Colette how to herd anything in my life, but she will actively herd children that get too far away from their parents. Or she likes to keep everyone in a group together. That's part of her selectively bred instinct. And you do herd the squirrels, that's true. You also know to bark when there's danger like six miles away. Now, learned behaviors on the other hand are things that an animal learns through experience or from other animals. Um, now, your instinct may be to bark when there's danger outside, when there's an intruder, like the mailman, but your learned behavior is to know that some people are friends and should not be barked at. We're still working on that. <laughs> and other people are dangerous, you know, like everybody else. Learned behaviors are just as important for an animal's survival. It could be a squirrel learning not to cross a certain street because it's super busy and it could get hit by a car. So learned behaviors are just another way of an animal learning to survive in its environment. Humans have an instinct to live together and converse, but how do they converse? The language humans learn is a learned behavior, whether that be Japanese, Italian, or sign language. These are all learned behaviors that we need to learn to communicate with our fellow people that we live with. There are so many examples of instinct versus learned behavior. So for the question of the week, rather than asking a question, I have a little assignment for you. Uh, I, wanna, I want you guys to look in your house, in your neighborhood, on a night, night to trail, and give me three things that you see that are learned behaviors and three things that are instinct. Go ahead and comment those down below. Thank you so much for watching. As always, links in the description will be down below for more resources or for our social media. And we will see you again next time. Bye.